Hey humans, how's it going? Susan Ruth here. Thanks for listening to another episode of Hey Human Podcast. This is episode 284, and I had a conversation with Scott Augenbaum. We talked oof, months ago, and it's finally coming up in queue. He is a cybercrime specialist. Uh, he was part of uh, the FBI's Crimes Against Children division. He was a coordinator for that. And he's a retired supervisory special agent. He now spends his time going around trying to protect the average citizen and beyond uh, against cybercrime, giving people the tools they need uh, to fight an ever-growing attack <laughs> on our cyber, you know, that, that email that says, click here because we want to talk to you about blah, 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 or that weird text you get or whatever. Uh, he talks a lot about different ways to protect yourself and what some of the largest threats are uh, against us through our uh, technological devices. He was kind enough to say we can email him. So all of my listeners, you can email him and you get two chapters about cybersecurity tips and parental tips about kid safety from his book, The Secret to Cybersecurity, and his email to get those chapters are, uh, well, I'll just spell it out for you, S-A-U-G-E-N-B-A-U-M at gmail.com. And as always, there will be a link with his email address and stuff like that on heyhumanpodcast.com's links page. So definitely go check that out to get your free two chapters. It was very nice of him to offer. I was introduced to Scott through our mutual friend, Wayne. So shout out, Wayne. Thanks for the connection. And of course, there is a plug in here for Manja Nashville's a beautiful, delicious restaurant owned by our mutual friend, Nick. If you're in Nashville, go to Manja. It's incredibly yummy. It's in the Melrose District. And for all of you celiacs out there, everything on that menu you can eat. Oh, and it's heaven. It's heaven. So there's a plug. I don't get paid to say that. I'm just saying it out of the love in my heart. Okay, other news. Social media. Hey Human Podcast can be found under Instagram and Facebook. You can email me, Susan, at heyhumanpodcast.com. As I mentioned, if you go to heyhumanpodcast.com, you will find the links page with all the cool links from every episode about every guest. Definitely do check that out. I've had some really super interesting people on the show, and there's so much deep diving you can do through that links page. So definitely do that. If you want to know more about me personally and all the other stuff I do, music and interviews that have been done with me, where the tables have turned, go to SusanRuth.com. And you can also be on the mailing list through SusanRuth.com. So sign up for that and you will get a mailer, I don't know, eventually <laughs> when I'm in the mood, which is usually, as I've mentioned before, maybe every seven, eight months. I don't know. Uh, I just got back from Seattle, by the way. Great trip. Had performances. I did improv, did musical show to a sold-out room. Um, man, it was so much fun. So if you like music and you want to hear some of what I do, check out Susan Ruth on iTunes or on Spotify. My last record, All I Ever Wanted Was Everything, came out in 2014. And all the other stuff is really pretty old, but that one's, you know, pretty current. So check that out. Rate and review Hey Human on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. If you've been thinking to yourself, I really need to put a rating and a review because I've been thinking about it and I haven't done it. It's super duper helpful. Please take the time. And it only takes a few minutes, if that, and, uh, and do that. So I appreciate that. Thank you very much. And I think that's it. I can think of what else I wanted to tell you about. And so let's get into the episode. Thank you for listening. Be well, stay safe, be kind, and uh, hang in there. Yeah? All right. Here we go. Guy Agenbaum, welcome to Hey Human. I am so excited to be here with you. We have some mutual friends who brought us together. So I feel like we're already old friends. That's right. <laughs> the circle gets smaller and smaller. Where did you begin your life? Where are you from? 
I am originally from Brooklyn, New York. I grew up in the 80s. I was raised by a single parent. And it was a lot different in the 80s than it is now. My mom was just excited when I was going from eighth grade to ninth grade. And when I graduated high school with a 72 average, she was just thrilled I was going to community college. And I didn't have the heart to tell her in order to get into community college, all you needed was a (laughs) high school diploma and not to be convicted of a felony. And I thought I'd get my act together at Kingsborough Community College in Brooklyn. And I graduated with a 2.27 grade point average. And when you have a 2.27 grade point average, the world is not knocking down your door with opportunities. But my mom, as part of her grand plan, found an opportunity for me to become an, a file clerk with the FBI, making $12,038 a year. And that's where my journey began in September of 1988 at age 20. So that was all happenstance. Did you as a kid have any kind of desire to pick things apart or get to the bottom of something or any of that sort of notion? No. None whatsoever. I, it, it was just kind of weird on how somehow life happens to you or for you. I mean, I was just kind of raised by my mom, raised by my grandmother, playing way too many video games, not really popular in high school or anything like that. Really very insecure. And then I get this job where I'm surrounded by a lot of positive role models that really shaped who I am today. And that's really kind of how the journey began it. You know, and I talk to kids all the time and they're like, Hey, did you always want to be an FBI agent? And I go, no, not really. I just didn't even think about it. Well, what did you want to do? No, I don't know. You know, it was just one of those types of things. Yeah. I had no idea that you can't go to community college with a felony. I make that. I made oh, that. Sounds okay. Pretty, sounds pretty good. <laughs> I was like, wait a minute, really? That doesn't seem right or fair. Yeah, I'm, okay. Come on. It just sounds it just sounds good for the story. Come on. I'm a natural <laughs> storyteller right now. I, I get that. And I always say, don't let the truth get in the way of a good story. <laughs> <laughs> um, what brought you then to, well, let's go one thing at a time. So you started out in the, in the mail room, as it were, the clerk's room, uh, you know, and, and worked your way up. Wow. As you were coming up in the in the FBI, did that pique your your curiosity, your interest, or will you just keep my head down, do my job, and see what happens next? So here's what happened. So I, I I start to surround myself with all these positive role models and everything. And the thing that they drill into me is you can't go through life between mediocre and below average. And in my mind, the only way to get out of that trap was to go back to school, which I hated school. But I went back to college at night after work and I got my bachelor's degree in liberal arts and I had a 3.8 grade point average. And then I had another dear friend of mine from New York, and she kind of inspired me to start working on an MBA in finance and technology. And then I get promoted up within the FBI. I'm doing financial work, but now I'm working on an MBA and I finally have a career goal that I want to go after. I want to go into the world of investment banking and finance and technology. So that's kind of where I am about 1994 or so. I'm going to college at night. I'm still living at home with my mom, 26 years old, still in the same room that I had. And an opportunity opens up to become a special agent with the FBI, which is a very prestigious thing. And the FBI has a hiring freeze going on at the time. And all of a sudden, my boss who was really the main father figure that I ever had in my life, told me about this and said, Scott, you got to put in for this job as an FBI agent. And I'm like, Bob, I'm working on an MBA in finance and technology. This isn't really what I want to do. I I don't have what it takes to be a law enforcement officer. I want to make deals. I want to do this. I want to do that. And he looked at me and I'll never forget. And he goes, he was a very stern figure, big guy, muscular. And he goes, Scott, you will put in for it. 
And I'm like, all right. And then I put in for it and I'm taking nine graduate level classes, not thinking and not even worrying about it. Well, everyone else was like, oh my goodness. And we were all professional support employees. So we were just not agents, not law enforcement, but we were the support that helped the agents. And all these other men and women wanted it so bad. And I'm like, I just don't really care. And the next thing I know, I'm driving down 95 and I'm pulling over and this is the Sunday before Thanksgiving 1994 and I get off the exit and I stop at Stafford there was a rest exit and I just went like this what the heck did I just do to my life now I'm kind of getting into it a little bit and I'm like wow and then I show up at the FBI academy and it was hard for me. I wasn't in great shape. I, I did unbelievable in the academics. I did unbelievable in the interpersonal communication. And I'm a kid. I'm 26 years old at the time. The average person in the FBI who was going through the academy with me was about 32 years old, professional person. Where there were helicopter pilots. There were CPAs. There were men. There were women. Most of them were in better shape than me. Most of them shot a gun better than me. And I kind of have this imposter syndrome. I'm like, what am I doing here? So I had to work really, really hard. And I think I'm going back to New York City. And I'm like, I'm getting excited. I'm going to go back to New York City. If I can't go work on Wall Street, I'm going to work white collar crime and put all the bad guys in jail. Or I'm going to go after our friend Nick's friends and family up in New York. And then I'll never forget, I get my orders to Syracuse, New York. And I'm like, oh my goodness. Do you know what are the two things that Syracuse is famous for? Syracuse. I do not actually. Snow, probably. Yes. Yes. You got it. Snowiest city in the United States, 190 inches of snow and basketball. That was it. And I'm like, oh my God, what did I do to my life? And I get up there and I am so, I have so much fun. Because that that means that you, you passed, you got into the FBI's training. I got into, no. Getting into the academy was one thing. Getting out was a different thing, (laughs) you know, and I got out and I passed and I worked hard. And that's where I feel that for me and, you know, I get out and I talk to a lot of kids because I'm so blessed to be where my journey has taken me. And I always tell people, do not give up. You know, even when you hear the voices in your head saying that you can't do it and it's taking you out of your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. And these are the things I never really dive in deep with with people. It's about if your goal doesn't scare you and if it doesn't take you out of your comfort zone, you're really not playing large enough. I agree with that. I agree with that. and, And here I am. I'm a brand new FBI agent. I'm in Syracuse, New York. It's 1995. I have a gun, a badge, a bulletproof vest, a car with lights and sirens. And I am having a blast because now I am playing like it's an adrenaline video game that I live in 24 seven, where there's a bank robbery, a fugitive, a drug case. And my skill set is communications. I know how to talk to people. I know how to bring people down, not down, but get their negotiator. Yeah. And I went to hostage negotiator school, too, which was probably one of the wildest things that I've ever done uh, for that. But I'm going to be honest, it kind of became my identity because I feel that I'm entrusted with all this power and all I want to do is help people and I want to put bad guys in jail. So that's what I end up doing. And let me tell you two things I did not join the FBI to do. One is public speaking, and the other was working cyber crime cases. I did not join the FBI to do that. And I remember the first time I did a presentation at Syracuse University, my boss made me do it, and it was about domestic terrorism. And do you remember speech class in college? Yeah. Yeah. Remember you were like this? Yeah. Hi, how are you? I'm Scott. That's honestly what the presentation was like. And, and it's amazing because 
33 years later, what do I do for a living now? I talk for a living and I teach cybercrime prevention. So, Well, so you were, you began in uh, domestic terrorism. That's really interesting. Were you, did you work on some of the bigger cases in the nation or no, was I it in, localized? I was in Syracuse, New York. So was and this was right after the uh, Olympic Park, bo- not the Olympic Park. I did go down. I did work on the Olympic Park bombing investigation. I'll talk to you about that. But this was right after the Oklahoma City bombing. McVeigh. Yeah, I yeah. wondered because the timing was right in there. Yeah. And, and, and that's when Congress started saying, look, we need agents to do this. So my job was to go out and interact with local law enforcement. And it was challenging back then too, because, you know, a lot of the stuff that people were doing was protected by their First Amendment rights. And the FBI would only get involved with that when there were threats of violence and stuff. And one of the things we were working about on a lot in the 90s, what I was in Syracuse, was the Animal Liberation Front, which were these individuals who were burning down uh, meat packing plants and bombing furriers in upstate New York. So that's really kind of where I got my start. But it was just you did everything. We were a small eight man office. We covered up to the Canadian border and every day was a brand new adventure and you were running and gunning. But things were simple then and things were easy. How do you mean? Well, all of a sudden, September 11th happens and it changes the focus of the FBI forever because the number one priority for the FBI is the prevention of terrorist activity and prosecuting terrorists. The number two priority for the FBI is counterintelligence, foreign governments stealing intellectual property, trade secrets, military secrets. And number three is cybercrime. So the FBI goes from more of a domestic law enforcement agency that's coordinating cases in the United States to now a majority of our adversaries now are located overseas. So we have a really, really big shift. And that kind of plays a lot into what I started doing with cybercrime, because when I get involved within the FBI forms a cyber uh, division at FBI headquarters in 2002. Now, I'm the only agent in the office who's working cybercrime, and I didn't want to work cybercrime. I was just the only guy in the office who had their ho- a home computer. Why did I have a home computer? Windows 95 came along. It was easy to use. It was plug and play. I was an early adapter into America Online. Do you remember America Online? My parents still have AOL. Yeah, of course. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. So that was it. So now I become the cyber guy in the office, which is not the fun and sexy job to have as an FBI agent. We have two female agents in our office. One is on the DEA task force, which is working drug cases. That's really cool. We have one who's working on the fugitive uh, task force force violent crimes. You know, she's a rock star. And then my duty, you know, and we all did a little of everything. I'm the cybercrime guy. And what are we doing? We're chasing thrill seekers. We're chasing amateurs. We're, ch- you know, young kids hacking into the Pentagon. It's not until the late 90s that cyber takes a very, very sinister turn Because now everyone's doing business on e-commerce. So when I go over to headquarters, and let me give you a little bit of a detour, I get sent to Atlanta in 1997 because I'm the domestic terrorism body. I go down there for 60 days to work on the Olympic Park bombing investigation. And what did I find? A young lady from Houma, Louisiana, who becomes my wife. And I take this young lady who's from Houma, Louisiana, which is really far south. And how do you think she feels when I bring her up to the city <laughs> with 190 inches of snow a year? Uh, I'm sure she was rather cold. I hope you bought her a lot of cashmere. <laughs> Yeah, but my life gets a hundred times better. And then her life, you know, I like to think it got a little better. 
But after five years there, I couldn't keep her there because the snow was too much. So I had to make a career choice. And the only way to get out of your office where you were was either to volunteer to go to New York or L.A. or one of the big offices or you get into the management program. So now I go to Washington, D.C., and I'm. Uh, I get a job in the cyber division of the FBI. And a lot of my friends make fun of me. They go, this cybercrime stuff is going to disappear. We're going to arrest every teenage hacker. And, and let me ask you, jobs. how's that? <laughs> yeah, no, no. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so that, I, that was kind of a thing, right? You would find the, the genius kid hackers and then get them to work for you. Yeah, but the, but there was a little bit of a problem that happened because, you know, I get to Nashville in 2007 because the FBI formed cyber task forces in all of their 56 field offices. This is the new trend. This is the new thing. So I think I'm getting in on the ground floor. So I get this great promotion to Nashville, Tennessee, and I go, this is unbelievable. It's a new technology. I'm on the leading edge like this is the place to be. And I get here, I have a squad with seven FBI agents, task force officers. And in my head, what am I going to do? I'm going to play the role of hero like I did in upstate New York. I'm going to work hard and we're going to put bad guys in jail because that's what we do with the FBI. We track things down. But one of the things I quickly discovered were cyber investigations were much different than traditional investigations, because in a traditional investigation, let's just think about what I said. There were bad people doing bad things to good people. I worked with state and local cops. We put bad guys in jail. Crime was a local problem back in the 90s. Your subjects were located in your area of responsibility. Now cybercrime comes up and now we're dealing with the international flavor of it. And in regular investigations, it was easy because, first of all, you knew where the bad guy was located. You had to build a case. Cyber investigations, the bad guy's located overseas and it's very difficult to prove who's behind the keyboard. Evidence in traditional investigations was stable. There were bank records. There was surveillance. There was recordings. Here, digital evidence disappears. Traditional investigations, what do we do? We follow the money. Cyber investigations, the money leaves net a bank account here and goes to a bank account in Nigeria, which becomes impossible to... Uh, to track down. So this is what I'm faced with. And for years, I'm dealing with this. And I really start to, I come up and during my career, I must have interviewed probably about a thousand victims. And it really was the same things time and time again. And I call this the four truths to cyber security. And it took me a while to figure this out, that they all had commonalities. The first commonality is none of my victims ever expected to be a victim. I'm just a small entertainment attorney. Who would want to target me? I'm a small restaurant in Nashville, Tennessee. There are bigger restaurants in Nashville, Tennessee. I'm a small business. I'm a nonprofit organization. I would deal with this with healthcare companies. They would say to me, I'm a small business. Let me ask you, what's your definition of a small business? What, what would you say would be small? I, I would say less than 30 people. Yeah. I had one company that was a $300 million company. Tell me they were a small business. What's your reaction to that? That sounds like a big business. So then I would go over and I would talk to companies on the publicly traded companies. And I started out with companies on the NASDAQ. And they would say to me, we're not worried. We're on the NASDAQ. The bad guys only want to target companies on the New York Stock Exchange. I would talk to publicly traded companies. They would say, we're not worried because we only have a net asset value of... $5.8 billion. And I would want to say, where are you getting your information from? People Magazine? 
the bad yeah, and guys also do- my, bad guys don't just want money they want identities they want histories they want all sorts of things it's not Everything just about finances that we have and and that was one of the things like and when i would go back to it and then when they would become victimized First of all, they were always perplexed that they were victimized. But then when I would go over and try to talk to companies, they would say, well, look, I have nothing important. I don't have money. And like, to your point, we all have email accounts. And I'm going to talk about that. Because that's the first thing the bad guys want is your email, because they want to impersonate you. They want access to your bank records. They want access to your customers. They want to trick you. So the first thing that everyone that I tell everyone, nobody ever expects to be a victim. And people don't really know what they need to protect. Because I want you to think about this. Think about it from your business or my business. We all have things that we need to protect. But tell me some of the things. Well, I I was going to say I have for this podcast, for example, I have humanpodcast.com. And I have uh, protections in place on the website that show me and the attacks are happening with the every every hour from all over the world. What's on there? Nothing. But they, yeah. But they here's what. I, to- and as we go through this, I'm going to explain exactly what they want, and I'm going to show people how, how to bulletproof it. Because one of the things that I do now is I teach people how to avoid cybercrime victimization without spending money and without being technical. And this is all going to build into it, but you'll hear about the before we get to the fourth truth, because think about whatever it is that you have that's valuable and think about your listeners here, whatever they have at home. You have your email, you have your bank account. Think about your security cameras inside your house. What happens if the bad guy steals username and password? What does he get? He gets a great show of everything you're doing inside of your house. So picture whatever you have that is valuable to you. And I'm going to tell you the second truth to cybersecurity. Imagine the bad guys, whatever they do, they steal whatever it is. And I want you to think about whatever it is, the most important asset that you have in your life. And you don't even have to tell me because the way your eyebrows will move, I'll be able to know which way. <laughs> Just kidding. So whatever it is is stolen. This is the second truth to cybersecurity. The bad guy steal your stuff. The chances of law enforcement getting your stuff back is slim to none. Okay. Yeah. Just just that simple. I mean, I've gotten lucky in a couple of occasions, but I've dealt with a thousand victims in my career and there were only very, very few. And by luck, we were able to get their money back. That leads me to my third truth about cybersecurity. The chances of law enforcement bringing the bad guys to justice is even harder than getting your stuff back because the majority of the cyber criminals are located overseas. They are located in China, Russia, Nigeria. Law enforcement, we do a good job of arresting people in the U.S. Not so good outside the FBI, the secret. Secret service, they're putting people in jail, but you're still not getting your stuff back. So yeah, there's all those those phone calls from all over the place that are the IRS wants to talk to you, you're in trouble, or your student loan has been forgiven, call us back, or your car is an extended warranty, call us back. All of these are phishing scams. Oh, and yeah. they sound too good to be true because they are, or they sound terrifying because they rely on you being afraid. Yeah, no, the IRS absolutely. doesn't call you. <laughs> yeah, but if, but if it didn't work, you. but if it didn't work, they wouldn't be doing it. And oh, who's oh, I know they make so much money. Oh, I know it works. It, it works on people that are distracted. It works on the elderly. It works on people well, that don't know better. Oh, yeah. And it's a very profitable business. But here's a couple of things. So let's just review for a second. Bad guys. We talked about this. Bad guys steal your stuff. You don't get it back law enforcement challenging, putting it in jail. The cybercrime problem, and according to Cybersecurity Ventures in 2015, the cybercrime problem, the global cost of cybercrime was a $3 trillion problem. And it went up to a $6 trillion problem by 2021. And that's before COVID-19 comes into our world. And now we're all working remotely 
and there's a 400% increase. Now, that number is scary, but the next number really upsets me when you put it into perspective with the first thing. In 2015, we spent about $88 billion globally keeping ourselves safe. So if you turn on cable news, if you turn on cable TV, you'll see infomercials to purchase products, services, antivirus, insurance, you name it. And by 2021, cumulatively, that goes up to a trillion dollars. So there's two facts that are here. One is the cybercrime problem keeps increasing. And the other is the spend keeps going up. I find that that bothers me because I'm going to ask you a simple question. What does it mean when the si- a problem continues to go up, but you keep spending money to keep yourself safe? What does that mean? It means that someone has figured out a good way to monetize your fear. Well, yeah, I usually don't say that, but that's right. But I think what you, you see, this is what we learned in crisis negotiation school. I think, Susan, what you're trying to say is I need to keep people safe from cyber criminals and the information security marketplace that's just trying to sell products and services. Because at the end of the day, and here I am, I'm at a conference and one day, One of the vendors comes over to me and says, Scott, we don't like your messaging. Well, what did I say? This is I said the fourth truth to cybersecurity. Almost 90 percent of what I dealt with in my career could have been prevented if the end users were just armed with a couple of key pieces of information. Think about that. That drives me to do what I do today, because one of the things that I discovered is there's nobody out there trying to help the end user to avoid becoming the victim. Everybody's selling a product and everybody is selling a service Mm -hmm. about this. And so now I'm going to say that's my obsession, That's my passion because I lead a passion project life. And what does that mean? I do what I love to do, which is sharing my knowledge with individuals. And I go around, I was going around the country and I get hired by companies to come in to train their employees on how to change their mindset. Because information security products and services, and I'm oversimplifying it, you need things to run your business. You need firewalls. You need antivirus. But let me ask you a question. What does it mean if 90% of what I dealt with could have easily been prevented? Where do you think we should start? With ourselves, where everything starts. With way, yeah. And what I've done is I've built a very, very simple framework, and I'd like to walk you through the steps of. Because that's what I'm doing now, and that's what I'm working with our good friend on, is this passion project that, because I can't give anyone an MBA in information security in an hour. But give me a couple of episodes of The Bachelor, and I could build a really good course, because I need to change your behavior. I need to change your mindset. So if I don't spend the time with you, as as I did, to explain it to you, Because as I said, you know, I started, I didn't go into this as a cyber genius. I didn't go into this. And this just happened to fall into my lap because I hit a wall in what I'm doing. I hit that wall because I've had to look in victims' eyes. I've had to look into women who've been victimized in romance scams. I've had to deal with an elderly gentleman who found a certificate of deposit on a bank online and sent $700,000 to this bank and the money was wire transferred to Georgia, the country of Georgia. I've seen businesses destroyed. I've seen children hurt. I've seen nonprofit organizations disappear. I've seen lawyers victimized, everybody. I've seen people extorted because the bad guys were able to get onto their cameras and do things. 
And 90% of it could have been prevented. So this is kind of my calling. This is what I've done. And just a couple of weeks ago, I was able to get onto the Dr. Phil show and not be embarrassed or learn anything. And I was able to use his platform to teach people because I want you to think about this. And this is the first tip for your users. What happens right now if you get an email that looks perfect and it's from the Department of Treasury telling you that your stimulus check is about to come? Is that believable at this time? Are we getting stimulus checks? Yeah, but I don't click on anything like that. Not personally. you. Not you. But what many people own? would. What about your parents? What about your friends' parents? Yeah. What about your listeners, oh, yeah. their parents? My okay. friend's mom, my friend's mom just got duped uh, out of, uh, she got a text from someone that said they were her friend and said, oh, I need a hundred dollars Amazon. I, that should have been a red flag firstly right away. But anyway, she fell for it and lost a hundred dollars, you know, some random yeah. scammer hacked into her phone system somehow. And yeah. So people are going to fall for it. Just think about my elderly mom in Brooklyn. If she, but, and I do a great job with my mom. I've, my mom will never be victimized in the cyber crime scam because the yeah. phone that I, the phone I gave her, she can't, she has, she doesn't know what the internet is. So if you ever meet her, don't tell her about it. There's no such thing as the internet. Yeah. I mean, I got an email the other day from quote unquote geek squad. They said, Hey, uh, we just want to let you know, we did the auto renewal on your geek squad. Now, I'm sure millions of people have Geek Squad and they probably are like, oh, cool, click on this to get your receipt. But I don't I don't have the Geek Squad. And also I'm suspect I'm suspect of those kinds of emails. So I Googled Geek Squad scam letter and it came up immediately. Don't click on that. It's a scam. So <laughs> you got but, but our goal, and that's why I'm so appreciative of this, is to teach this to your users. So let's yes. go through the let's go through the first point. The first point is to realize that email is the number one attack vector used by cyber criminals. And you are not going to get an email from Boris Badnoff at cybercriminal.org telling you that there's a problem. You're going to get an email from somebody you know or somebody you trust. And today it will probably look like and it's coming from the Treasury Department saying, click on this link to get get your stimulus check. All you need to do is enter your username, date of birth, and social security number. And not username, your last, your full name. And now you become the victim of identity theft at that point in time. So some people will go like this to me and I can sense it. I'd never fall for that. My mother would go, I'd never fall for that e either. But what happens when you get that text message? So think about this. I just registered for my COVID-19 vaccination. They asked for my cell phone number. They said they would text me when it come, when, I, when my appointment's ready. Well, okay. Oh, I know not to click on a link in an email, but what about a text message? What about the telephone call? So it's the social engineering aspect. So we have to become a human firewall. We have to think before we click. I have a hold on all of my, I went to, I called TransUnion and Equifax and everybody, because I mean, I'm not buying a house or a car or anything anytime soon. So I put a hold on everything that it's is freeze, related yeah. to my, a freeze. Yeah. And, it, and, and it I'm going to show everybody how to do that. That's the, everyone needs that. These are the little assignments we're going to give people because I am going to show people today, by the time we get done with this, how they're going to avoid 90% of victimization. But think about this. Think about you're familiar with the Black Friday shopping, right? And Cyber Monday. Sure. What do you do for Cyber Criminal Tuesday? Do you celebrate? Have you ever heard of that? <laughs> because think about this. 170 million people shop over that weekend. What do you think happens? 170 million people shop. And what do the cyber criminals do? They send an email out going like this. Your package has been delayed in shipping. Think about that. Or there has been a problem. Your item is out of stock. Think before you click. Log into the websites when it happens. Call the telephone numbers and that kind of stuff. Not the telephone numbers in the email. Get the actual. So good. 
Yeah. You were you 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 got it. I, that's what we get because here's the email you're going to get. This is this is how they trick people. In the old days, they would say your bank account's about to be locked out. Please enter in username and password. We all know not to do that, even though it still works. So here's what they're going to send you. You're going to get an email today. It's going to look like it's coming from your bank. It's going to say, "Hey, Susan, we just want to let you know we picked up a suspicious transaction on your email." on your account login, somebody tried to log into your either bank account or they made a purchase at a electronic store in Brooklyn, New York in the amount of $1,850. We're telling you because we've installed an artificial intelligence platform and we do not believe this is you. However, if this is a legitimate purpose purchase, don't do anything. And in 90 minutes, the purchase will go through. What goes through the average person's mind if they just got that email? What would they think? That they, they, they got their thing stolen. And of themselves. Yeah. So here's the next thing. It says, but don't worry. If this is a legitimate purchase, don't do anything at all. However, if this is a fraud, all you need to do is call the 1-800 number in the email or click on the link. What's the majority of the population going to do? They're going to call or click on the link and they're going to get brought to the bad guy. Or yeah. Girl. yeah, no, exactly. So that's but think about this. We're not going to get this email when we're just sitting back and we're so relaxed and we're in a great frame of mind, we're going to get this in the middle of the day. We're going to get this when we're stuck in traffic. We're going to get this when we've just been aggravated and you're going to see this and you're going to go, oh, crap. Or what if I get an email from the kid's school saying that my son has been suspended? Click on this. We have to become a human firewall. We have to change our mindset. So that is point number one. We have to think before we click. The second thing is we need to take an inventory. We need to know what do we need to protect? What are these mission critical assets? Because now all the bad guys really need to do is steal your username and password. So what accounts do you have in your life that the bad guys could take over? What if, and a lot of people don't even think about this, like the entrepreneurs, are we securing our GoDaddy account? You want the bad guy to take over you? We don't want bad guys to take over our cloud-based accounts. So think about this. What do we have? We have email. We have social media. What do you think happens when the bad guys take over your social media platform and they send a message out to all of your friends saying, for being such a great friend, I'm going to give you this coupon for a grande latte at Starbucks because nobody thinks you're good enough to give them a vente. But they will believe it, grande. (laughs) And now everyone, because that's digital marketing. What do we do in digital marketing? We want people to click on our links. And when they click on the link in your social media, and now you install, and you're familiar, how long does it take you to build a brand? Uh, A while. (laughs) How long do you think it could take for you to destroy that brand? An hour or less. 10 minutes, probably one click with the right. One yeah. Click the right the post. And I would go so far too. So I have a mailing list subscription thing. I send out mailers. I'm really lame about it. I do it like every six to eight months. However, I, you can sign up for the mailer through one of my websites and I, I, I get so many different emails and I always take that email that I get and I can, I run it through a, a system that tells you whether it's a good email or a bad email before I'll enter it because it'll tell you if it's a skill, this is associated with spam. This is blah, blah, blah. And then I won't enter it into my program. So yeah, it's a full-time job. It's just try. It's a pain in the ass, but it's definitely helpful to do that. Yeah. 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 No, absolutely. So think about it. So let me ask you, so I, we need to identify our mission critical accounts. So what do you think, what's mission critical to you that if the bad guys would get into your life would, we don't want them in your bank account. You don't want them in your, your social media. As I mean, as a person that is out on in the world, seen by Mm -hmm. the world, those are the top two. Well, you know what else here? Your healthcare maybe. 
your your Apple ID, very, sure. very important because if yeah. they get in, they're going to see all your stuff. Your yeah. cell phones, because they can take over your cell phone accounts. If we have any cameras in our houses, any alarms mm-hmm. or anything like that. For parents, it's the Xbox, because honestly, if your kid gives out his Xbox account, someone's going to be buying stuff on your uh, baby monitors or a thing. Yeah. Anything. Or how about this? You know, how many of us are putting things in Dropbox? Mm hmm. And what do a lot of people put in Dropbox? They put work stuff in there. So we need to identify what are our mission critical accounts, our personal mission critical accounts and our work mission critical accounts. And I'd say everybody has, and we don't want to drive ourselves crazy because we just need to start with identify what would the bad guys steal? Like if the bad guys get access to my LinkedIn account, it's game over for me because I have a tribe of about 8,000 people. I cannot have that because I send legitimate stuff out. At one time I was using Salesforce. Well, if they get access to Salesforce, again, game over. If they get access to my email account, game over. QuickBooks, they can send out invoices. So I want everyone here, think about things. That's how we get our mindset. Now, what we have to realize, because one of the questions I get all the time is, hey, Scott, what's the dark web? And I go, the bigger question is, let's keep your stuff off the dark web. Yeah. Because yeah. on the dark web, which is the digital underground, is a lot of information. So I'm going yeah. to go through an example with you. In 2014, Yahoo was breached. And there were almost 3 billion usernames and password combinations were stolen. Do you remember, what did Yahoo tell us all to do? Do you remember that? Change our passwords. That's right. Change <laughs> our password. So let's just assume for this example, everybody changed their password. I still have people who go, Yahoo was breached. I'm like, yes, Yahoo was breached. Everything has been breached at this point. <laughs> yeah. So let me ask you a question. Out of those 3 billion Yahoo users, what percentage do you think have either an iPhone, an iPad, or a Mac computer? Take a guess. You don't need to come up with it. I, just I mean, 80%. It's probably a lot. A lot of people do that. Let's say we can easily say it's more than 10%, right? Sure. So I'm going to go down. I'm going to say it was only 5%. Let's just say it's 5%. I know it's probably like 40 or 50, but what is 5% of 3 billion besides a lot? A lot, I, a lot. I think it's 150 million. So let's just say on the low end, there are 150 million people who were impacted here. Okay. A lot of people ask me, or I got a max or do max get viruses? And I got good news. The virus writers aren't writing max. The virus writers aren't writing viruses for Max. You want to know why? They're banking on the fact that 60 to 70 percent of the population is using the same password for multiple platforms. So now they take this list and that's on the low end. And instead of 60 to 70 percent, let's even just say it's 10 percent. What's 10 percent of 150 million? 15 million. So there's 15 million people on the lowest end that have the same username and password for their Yahoo account as everything else. That is why we need to start making it a point. We cannot use the same password for mission critical platforms. Not only that, but you can't let it ride forever. You have to change it up. And my bank passwords, I change every month. And I'm going to show you how I have passwords. I haven't changed them in four years. I'm going to explain why I'm going to explain to you why I don't need to do that. I, I don't believe I need to do that. Now we need to identify our mission critical accounts. And now we need to make sure we don't have the same password. So that's it. So now this is where we are in the framework. So the next thing we have to realize is what's a good password and what's a bad password. My son, Aiden, was born in 2002 and Quinn was born in 2005. Do you think I ever used those two as passwords? Of course I did. 
back in the day. Of course I did. And I'm smarter than most people. I had two passwords. I wasn't that guy with one. I had two <laughs> passwords. So why did I use Aiden 2002 and Quinn 2005? Because it was easy to remember for you. Easy to remember for me. And who's going to figure that out? And then I came up, I had this great system. Look, my initials, my wife's initials and the anniversary date. Who's going to figure that out? Well, we know that does not work today. So in order for you to have a good personal password at home, this is my personal recommendations. It should be a minimum of 12 characters. Why do I say 12? Because if I told you 15, you'd tune out right now because I'm going to show you. So they should be a minimum of 12 characters, uppercase, lowercase, special symbol and a number and no dictionary word. And now you need probably 15 to 20 for every one of your mission critical accounts. What do you mean by no dictionary word? You mean don't use a word like cat or hamster or anything like so, that? I love to eat at Manja Nashville, you know, is not a good password. Okay. okay. But I'm going to yeah. show you what we're going to do. So what I want you to do is, yeah, we don't want to have dictionary words because there are machines out there that run brute force attacks, but I don't see that a lot, but I'm going to show you how we're going to, I'm going to show you in three minutes, how we're changing all of our passwords. I want you to come up with a special symbol and a number and don't share it with everyone, because if you do, we're going to guess them. So for this example, let's come up and let's say my special symbol and a number is going to be dollar eight. OK, so that's a special symbol and a number. So if I'm going to create a password, a password, I'm going to put dollar eight on the front and then I'm going to flip it and do eight dollar in the back. What have I just done? I have given you four characters towards your 12 character password. You can use that in all of your passwords and I'm going to explain why. Now we're going to come up with a passphrase. And, but we're going to take the first letter off of each word and we're going to put that in. So the phrase is going to be nothing more to remind us what the password is. Okay, so let's come up with a complicated phrase. This is what I believe is my wife's Amazon uh, phrase. I love to shop at Amazon very, very much. So how would we do that? I like phrases that start with an I because I use the number one. So it'd be dollar eight. We do one for I. Then we do L for love. What would we do for two? Uh, I love to shop. Uh, the number two. The number two. Then we do S for shop. And then what would we do for at? At sign. Yeah. Okay. Then we'd go very v and then i like to capital capitalize the last letter and if you would write that out right now and you would look at that you would go i can't remember that and then i would just go like this hey what was the phrase i love to yeah. shop at amazon very much what do we do write the phrase down use the phrase to jog your memory because when you go to the keyboard and you type that out, you're going to see how your fingers will find everything. Yeah. But let's not make them all predictable. Maybe your password for your bank account would be, uh, I love to go to Manja Nashville for dinner. I like phrases like that. I love to go to. Now you're using double twos. It's all thrown in. And this is something that I want to challenge everyone today. Song lyrics, you can use poetry. Anything. You can use, yeah. Anything. Get these book, <laughs> book titles. Don't make them all predictable because if not, you don't want every one of your phrases to go, I love to bank at uh, SunTrust. I hate to bank at SunTrust. You can right. do them with some things, but even if the bad guys get it, you have your special symbol and a number. So how do you remember all this? Have a list of song phrases sitting around and you'll know what they are or do them and don't make them as predictable. Have your favorite vacation place, this and that, things that you'll never forget, like things about your kids. And, and, and they can be goofy. It's not the way we talk. My 
son Quinn. I'm never going to say my son Quinn, but M S, you know, it's three extra letters plays right tackle or could bench a hundred, you know, anything come up with it. So somebody will always come to me and say, I create 25 character passwords. And I go, you got way too much free time. I can't do that. But there's one problem with this. What do you think happens if you have that 20 character, really good password and you get an email from your mom or your, someone you know, at the end of the day, we're going to click on a link. We're going to click on a link. We can't stop ourselves. And then someone steals our username and password. What happens? They log in. That's why something called two-factor authentication was created. And two-factor authentication is another methodology that will keep the bad guys out. And I like, I'll like i explain to you what accounts you should do this with first. You need to do this with your email. You must have two-factor authentication set up on your email. All the email platforms have it. So here's what you would do. And you can Google it on your platform, but you're going to go to options. You're going to go to security settings. You're going to look for where it says two-factor factor authentication, and you're going to check a box and say yes. Then it's going to ask you to do something you're not going to want to do. If you haven't had this installed, do it this way first. It's going to ask you for your cell phone number. You're going to enter in your cell phone number. It's going to log you off the platform. Then you are going to log in. It's going to say enter username. Enter your password, and then a screen's going to pop up when you hit log in. It's going to say, please provide your random six-digit code. You're going to go, what does that mean? And then you're going to see a text message from the provider. You're going to put that in the box. Then you're going to check, would you like to remember this computer? You're going to say yes. Now, this computer is a trusted device, which means anytime you log into your Gmail account, Your computer knows that this is you. You're going to do it on your cell phone because now when you log into your email from your cell phone, that's not a trusted device. So it's going to force you to enter in the code. Again, you're going to do this. So you don't have to do it every time. I do this on my email so I can just access it. Let me explain when it becomes a pain. So if I go to my sister's house, so just think about this in the old days before two fact, if I didn't have two factor authentication and I went to my sister's computer and I logged in because I need to go into the G drive to get Nick's recipe. And I, I, in the old days, I would enter in my username and I would enter in my password and what would happen? You'd get access to Google, right? But now that I have two-factor authentication, what should happen when I log into my sister's account? It'll say, I don't recognize this computer. It's not an authorized computer. Do you want to proceed? Um, And also, you have to re-get you to put in the code again. And so what always happens to me? I go like this. I go, where's my phone? Oh, my God. I usually leave my phone in the car. So two things happen. It's either raining out. (laughs) <laughs> or my wife took the car. But that's it. So let me get, let's run a quick quiz right now. You have just done this, or this has happened in my life. My wife, Maureen, comes to me and says, Honey, I just got a text message from Uber with a random six digit code. What just happened? I didn't log into Uber. So what happened? Why would she get a, on her cell phone, why would she get a text message from Uber? Somebody stole her username Uh, and password. So, and so she's getting the thing and now she knows that she has to go in and change. But how do you, how do you change your password if somebody's changed it on you? They didn't change it. They couldn't change it. They can't get into your account. You had two factor authentication installed. Got it. So she comes to me, she goes, honey, what do I need to do? Do I need to change your password? And I go, you could, if you want. She goes, but the bad guys have the, have the password. 
I go, yeah, but they can't get in because we have two factor. She goes, so we're safe, right? I go, as long as you don't use that password for any place else. And then I she see. said, oh, crap, and ran upstairs. <laughs> they go, How did they get her password? Who knows? Maybe she clicked on the link. Maybe when one of the data breaches happened, because here's another thing that I'm seeing all the time. People are getting emails from their. It looks like they're coming from their own email account. And it's going to say, Susan, here you are. Here's an email. Here's your password. And we have a video of you doing inappropriate things on your computer. And unless you pay us an extortion of X number of dollars. Now, if you start correlating... Well, they're banking on people who do have stuff like that, right? That will pay. Well, and, and, yeah, and just remember, they got your password too. Yeah. So now they're starting to think about this, and this is a complete scam. So doing those things here are really important. But here's the other thing you have to consider. All right, so I have just taught you how to keep your stuff safe. But that what about the keychain places? Like, you know, there are apps that supposedly keep all your passwords. My friend Ellen's always like, get that. It'll keep all your passwords. I'm like, isn't that also vulnerable? I don't know. Well, I, I use my system. I personally don't use the keychain. However, if you have hundreds of passwords, then you could consider doing something like that. But if you're not using two-factor authentication and it's a cloud-based account, it's a single point of failure. So keep that in mind. So even if your listeners do all this, you know what we're not taking into consideration? The first point about email, what do you do when your vendor sends you something that says we need to change bank account and bank account information? We have to think before we act. And at the end of the day, you know, those things here, and we talk a little bit about ransomware. So these are the courses that I'm trying to build right now, because as I said, I need to get in and I use very, very specific examples of cases and studies and stuff to change your behavior because storytelling works. So if I can put you into the place of a victim. Now, if we think about what I just told you to do, we need to really Realize email is the number one attack vector. We need to think before we click and think before we act. We need to realize that password reuse is a cyber criminal's best friend. We need to identify our mission critical accounts have separate passwords for our mission critical accounts, turn on two-factor authentication. And the last thing is freeze your credit. Go out there because the bad guys will get your information. If you do those eight things, you will reduce your chances of becoming the next cybercrime victim without being technical and without spending money. Let me yeah. ask you, how much money do you need to spend to go do the things I told you to do? Zero. Zero. And you want to know why people don't talk about this? There's no money to be made. It's the same reason yeah. why anybody makes money off of fear in any, I mean, yeah. Well, I do it empowering people. Yeah. Because, yeah. Here, here, you know, I wrote a book called The Secret to Cyber Security, A Simple Plan to Keep You and Your Family Safe. And I tell people, if you like to read books, go get the book. If not, here, go do the eight things that I told you to do. Yeah. Do these things and you will be fine. It's that simple and it's that important. And what I want to do for your listeners, I want to give out my email address because I, you know, I always joke, I say you should buy my book for one simple reason to learn how to keep your kids safe and how to keep your parents safe. But I don't want to make money doing that. So I tell people, shoot me an email and I'll give you those two chapters for free and I'll give you my list because that's my passion project life. And that's I've been great. able to figure out a way to do these things. And I get hired by large companies to do training. And it allows me to do what I love to do because I want to get in front of millions of people and empower them not to become the next cybercrime victim. That's great. What's your email? My email is s. Augenbaum, and hopefully you'll put a link to that at I will, gmail, I will. S. Augenbaum at gmail.com. And then we can see how many people are actually are listening to your podcast. <laughs> or if you take that time to do it. It's yeah. A U G E 
and B A U M is the last name. Spelling. And what I'm going to do is I am going to give them the two chapters of my book on how to keep their kids safe. And then I'm going to give them another chapter about another alert about the business email compromise, which is the number one threat and some information on two factor authentication and how to be safe. But at the end of the day, that's the most important thing that I do. And, you know, I love talking about this and I appreciate you having me on. I can sit here. Oh, this is great. Know, we can sit here. I have a can... couple of questions. Oh, about no, no, me. I'm not in a rush. I'm just going to tell you oh, I'll okay. stay all day. I, I mean, listen, I can do this all day. I just want to, you know, get, take this in any direction. I want you to be, ask me anything in the world you want. It's like you have a former FBI agent on your show who will answer yes. any question. The three questions I have, uh, one, about the dark web, did you have to do work in that realm with uh, things like ch- uh, human trafficking, child trafficking? Also, the insurrection on the 6th, uh, the FBI, of course, is using data to to help solve who was there and all that kind of stuff. Can you talk about any of those things? Yeah, let's go about the, f- let's, let's go about the first one. Okay. <laughs> I handled child exploitation cases. I was the Crimes Against Children coordinator for years in Nashville. And back in the day, it was a little different because we had no shortage of child predators who were coming here to hurt our children. But what didn't we really talk about? What happened then? The computer was in a public room. You could see what your kids are doing. Today, you're giving your children cell phones. And now kids have unrestricted access to anything that they want. And I hate to say it, there's no piece of, there's no one single piece of technology that is going to keep your kids safe. Your kids will figure it around it. And the thing that we have to take into account right now is a lot of children have been home online with virtual technology for the past year. And what are they doing? They're also spending another eight hours playing video games. When I was a kid and I was bullied in school and we didn't talk about that and I ran home, I was safe. I played with my toy soldiers. I had my little universe to escape reality. But now your reality follows you everywhere. And there's been a rash of child suicides and teen suicides and depression all being linked to these online gaming platforms. So I'm going to send you another email. Parents, you have to stay on top of this type of stuff. Because in the old days, I was worried about children getting uh, kidnapped, and that still happens. Now, I'm more concerned about the 15-year-old girl who takes a topless photo of herself, sends it to one friend, and what does he do? Send it to 50 people, and it shows up all over the place. And there's no amount of therapy can fix that for your kids. So you have to really teach them this at the youngest age. So now what do I do? I'm still, I'm talking to parents in elementary schools because you're not going to go back and you're not going to go back to your 16 year old daughter and take her phone away at this point. So that to me is the most important thing over here. And I, and I talk about this in the book that I wrote was about two years ago. I didn't dive into as much on the cyber bullying, but there are some really good resources in the book about some really good websites. Parents, you need to read that. You need also, to Also, kids need to understand that anything they put on the internet is there forever. It doesn't go away. Your texts, your videos, your photographs, everything you say and yeah, do. But, but, but I, I'm going to, and, and I get a lot of flack for this because I say, parents, you're not good role models. And they all go, what do you mean? I go, when you go on vacation and you post a picture that you are out of town for a week, it's the same thing as saying, please rob me. But we don't care because we want, as adults, we want that instant satisfaction. I was with my wife in San Juan, Puerto Rico. I did a video of me talking about a cyber secure mindset. Because I asked people, what is a cyber secure mindset? And I said, you want to know what a cyber secure mindset is? Me taking a video of myself on the beach and not posting it until I come home. 
That's what I, yeah, I always wait. Yeah, but sometimes I can't. Sometimes I'm at a conference and people are tagging me. So we we live in a very complicated world. So that's the first one. What was the other one that you were talking about? The capital was, well, the dark web, of course, is fascinating to me. Um, And then the capital, the insurrection. Let's just think about things that happened on how amazing technology is. On the Boston Marathon bombing, we would not have been able to put that together without the use of technology. Okay. The same thing. We just had a major bombing in Nashville, Tennessee. And what you're able to reconstruct through that. So I tell people all the time, we have to be very, very careful because we do not have an expectation of privacy when we, when we are outside, whatever we are posting on social media. And and I just love this. I go, all right. So people are upset. They're posting pictures of themselves, technically trespassing, going, hey, look at me. I'm in here. And oh, my God, I can't believe law enforcement, uh, you know, law enforcement did that and that kind of stuff. So those are the things. But it takes so much to get a warrant to get into someone's account. But hey, listen, as as long as you leave your privacy settings open, that any crazy person can look at every single photo on you. And I see this a lot now because I had to move to Facebook, which I swore I would never be on. But for my promoting my book and my business, and I see these people are having these pictures of their kids on the beach and every picture of themselves. And I'm like, it's open to everybody. I'm like, this is great. You need to share how good you look and everything like that. But why do you want to share that with the world? Maybe I'm just, this is what happens when you're 53, right? You turn into your parents. You just don't get it. Yeah. And it can be dangerous. I mean, child pornography, it takes all forms. And, uh, and what about stalking? There, what about there's stalking? There's all sorts of stuff. I mean, the internet is this bizarre place that has great benefit and it's a cesspool of disaster. Yeah. And now we have to balance it out. That goes into a whole nother thing about balancing privacy and do tech companies, should they do it? It's hard. I don't even know where I stand on all of that because we never even thought about this years ago. And now it's like everybody, and I hate to say it, there's, you know, and people think like within the FBI, the hoops that I had to jump to get information, to get if a criminal was doing something to get access to their cell phone, it was so labor intense and it, so much yeah. probable cause had to go into it. But as individuals, like, you People know, you put don't everything have- out there on the Internet. You guys, the, the work probably is a lot easier when the criminals are posing with their piles of money or their guns. Or, you know? Yeah, because we we're so in need of likes and that dopamine rush that that people will post everything. The only thing that's a lot more dangerous today than when I was doing it in the old days, it was really, really easy to when you had an arrest warrant or you had a search warrant, it was easy to go over to somebody's house. Now everybody has a ring doorbell. Um, that is really there's a lot of surveillance that's going on. And we just had two FBI agents that were killed uh, mm-hmm. executing a search warrant in Miami, Florida, two young FBI agents. And it's because the bad guy had the ring doorbell and he saw them coming and armed up and shot them because he probably yeah. thought they were going to arrest him and they weren't going to arrest him. They were just searching his house for, for evidence of the crime. One of the things I really want to bring up to you, too, and I cover this a lot in my book, is the romance scams, especially for women. Oh, I mean, yeah, definitely. There's just so much over there that if you were going online, you know, what you used to just have to worry about were the psychopaths that you would actually meet. Now there's the scammers that are online. 
And they and they do such an amazing job because what do we want to do at the end of the day? We just want to connect with someone. We just want somebody that we could talk to. And they have figured it out to the T that they ha- they're able to build these unbelievable romances with these people online because you have someone, he's in a foreign country, he's talking to you for an hour or two and he's so cool and he's so this and he doesn't want anything and he's not going to touch you with, You know, eventually you're going to see and he sends himself these pictures and then one thing leads into another and they want to go on vacation and he wants to come in. I've seen people built that of hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. Wow. When I was single, it was just a victory if I got a woman to buy me a drink. And now these guys are able to figure out how to get hundreds of thousands of dollars. So sad. It's so sad. So when you're, when you're dating someone or you're meeting someone online, be a snoop, Google them, check them out, find out as much as you can about them. Look at the picture, see if that picture is being used at other websites Everybody should have, as I like to say, some type of legend, a history. If Mm -hmm. you meet someone and they have no history whatsoever, there's a good chance you cannot keep yourself off the Internet. Can I tell you how many times on Facebook I get friend requests from supposed recently widowed they're usually in the military or a police you know they're always like a good or a teacher and they just do you know, i'm just like delete 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 I cl- and they have like four pictures and oh, they yeah, really no, do listen. try that scam it's always somebody it's it's generally somebody in the military or police because i guess they figure women will be like oh he's a, immediately a good guy you know Oh, yeah. And now they're preying on people like that. And just think about now how many people are getting divorced and how many people don't want to be by themselves and how many people just on this way are able to communicate and talk online. And, you know, it's so much safer. And then you build that rapport. And then at the end of the day, you just don't even know what hit you. And it broke my heart time and time again. You know, the yeah. guys, they were all looking for sex, so it wasn't as bad. But the women were looking for love. Yeah. Scott, I really appreciate your time and all this information. It's, you know, I'm immediately going to call my parents and make them change all their passwords <laughs> to something. Actually, they're pretty good. My dad is, uh, he's definitely, he knows what's up on secure passwords. My mom's a little less, you know, yeah, of savvy. Course. But, of course. No, this yeah. is... Uh, This is great. Thank you so much for giving me this platform to at least go out and educate people. Absolutely. Yeah. Scott, thank you for being on. And I'm going to put links on heyhumanpodcast.com for people to be able to find you easily with your email and all that kind of stuff. So that they can reach out if they have questions or to get the pet chapters that you talked about. I really appreciate that you did that too. So, Oh, no, no, no. That's great. Thanks for listening, everybody. Bye. Rate and review Hey Human on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks. Bye.